It's great to be up here with you this weekend. You know, the two th three things that I remember the last time I was here, before the first meeting, there were some uh, young gentlemen. They were probably five or six years old. And they came up to me, and this was four years now, mind you, four years ago, and they looked up at me and they said, how old are you? And I said, well, how old do you think I am? And one little boy said, I think you're about 89. And I said, well, that boy wasn't taught political correctness. So then I looked at the other little guy and I said, and how, how old do you think I am? He said, oh, I think you're about 93. <laughs> And I looked at the two boys and I said, boys, where are your parents? <laughs> and they said, well, right over there. And I went over to the parents and I said, uh, you never taught your children to be politically correct, did you? <laughs> and they said, well, what do you mean? And I said, well, your, your boys have just told me I'm, I'm somewhere between 85 and 95 years old. And uh, they, they chuckled and we had a nice little laugh. And I was hoping to see those two young men here, but of course, maybe I'll see them tomorrow. Uh, the next thing that I still remember about the meetings uh, four years ago, the, very, uh, the, the following week uh, from the time I was here, COVID, COVID-19 hit. It was in the second week of March of 2020. And I remember everything was shutting down and it was just chaos. And the third thing I remember about that time is, is um, my dear mother of 95 years old, uh, almost 96, she passed away four years ago uh, this coming week. So, uh, Wonderful memories of four years ago and what God has done since then. Uh, amazing, amazing. Um, I'm not quite in my upper 80s yet or in my 90s. Uh, but you know, as, as Pastor Turner was talking tonight about revival and reformation, I was thinking, you know, it's been 40, 47 years ago this October that God in his graciousness chose to call me to, to his side almost 47 years ago. And I was a young man at that point. I was a sophomore, I guess, freshman or sophomore in college. And, uh, you know, as I, as I thought about it, I thought, almost 47 years. Wow. What, what has, what's kept me? Why am I still here? I mean, there's so many people, whether it be in family, church, friends, uh, people, you know, in self-supporting work, in conference work, all of them telling me I'm, I'm just... Uh, you know, I've got a couple of screws missing, you know, but I'm still here. <laughs> and you know, I thought, well, of course, as the song says, as I look back on this road I've traveled, I see so many times you've carried me through. And if there's one thing that I've learned in my life, 
is my Redeemer is faithful and true. Um, let's see, the refrain goes, my Redeemer is faithful and true. Everything that he said he would do. And every morning his mercies are new. Because my Redeemer is faithful and true. And friends, it's, it's still true 47 years later. Jesus is faithful and he's true. And we can count on him. We can count on him. Everybody else, you know, uh, <laughs> oh well. A lot of folk don't like me. But you know what? You know, does, does it hurt? Yeah, it, it hurts. I'm a human being, folk, and, and when somebody, you know, says something mean or, or unkind about me, does it hurt? Yeah, it hurts. It hurts. But Jesus has always been there. He's always been faithful. And I thank, I thank the Lord tonight for his faithfulness. You know, the other thing that's been such a blessing to me is Bible prophecy. Um, I could tell a story about that, but um, you know, we have been so blessed as a people, and I wanna start with 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 19 tonight. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 19, and then we'll go to the slides on church and state together the devil's final assault. The Bible says we have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto ye do well that ye take heed, as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. Folk, you know, I had a gentleman this week, I, I won't mention his name, but a gentleman sent me a, a document, a packet, uh, an envelope this week, had probably 10, 15 pages in it, and he, he was discussing with me his understanding of Daniel chapter 11, you know, the end of Daniel 11, on the final king of the north. And uh, in the little margin, or well, little corner of this manila envelope, he said, there's truth inside. And I thought, oh good, I love to hear truth. Well, when, I, when somebody says there's truth, immediately I think, well, that person's gonna point me back to the Bible. And he's gonna point me to Christ as the truth. Because Jesus said, I am the way, and what else? He said, I am the truth, and I am the life. Well. So I thought, okay, I'm gonna read through this the first time, and I'm gonna look for every single Bible verse that is used to prove what this person is saying. That's a fair, that's a fair deal, isn't it? If he says he's focusing on the truth, then I should expect to see the Bible mentioned, shouldn't I? You know what, folk? In those 10 to 15 pages, there was not one, there was not one Bible reference in the entire document. There was not one spirit of prophecy statement in that entire document. And I, <laughs> I looked at it after I went through it and I said, I thought, I, I thought it said there was truth inside. Well, if there's truth inside, then the word of God is going to be quoted here. Not one time, friends, not one time. And I thought, you know what? This is going to the circular file. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly where it went. Because I thought this isn't worth reading twice. Folk, 
<laughs> Folk can call me all kinds of names. They can say whatever they want about me, but I, I'll just let you know one thing is I, I want truth. And I want it wherever it takes me. I, I just want what is true. And don't play games. Don't play Kate. Don't, don't try to be politically correct. I just want truth. That's all. So if, if somebody wants to play a game, well, you go ahead and play your games, but I'm not going to play with you. And if you seek to, uh, you know, it, it come into my sphere, then you're going to hear about it. You know, I mean, some folk, and we can talk about this tomorrow. I know I'm going to I'm going to hear about it next week when I'm going to have meetings in California. A lot of people love a man named Walter Weiss. Now, maybe maybe some of you do, and and that's great. That's great. But I'm going to tell you, Walter Weiss has chosen to come into to my sphere. Okay, and to have contact with me. And uh, <laughs> I've been shocked at this man. I've been shocked at the interaction we've had. And if you want to ask me about it tomorrow, I'd be happy to tell you the story. Okay, I'd be happy to. Um, but folk, I'm not here to play games. I'm not here to... Uh, you know, some folk in, in self-supporting work, you know, they say, well, you know, uh, I got to say things a certain way because if I don't, folk, folk won't put money in the till. That's the motive? That's the reason why we say or don't say certain things because of money going in the till or not? Folk, if, if that is the reason for why we do anything, we're in a heap of trouble. We're in a heap of trouble. It's got to be, is this what God says? If it is, then that's the way we go. End of story. But if we sit back and we say, well, you know, if I do this, then this is going to cut off this income. Well, I can't do that then. Well, then you're in, you're in the wrong business, friend, if, if you're in a business where you're saying, I'm doing this for, for God. Because you're no longer doing it for God. You're doing it for your little G, which is your money. And folk, uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of ministries, there's a lot of churches out there, and that's what they're all about. It's about money. Um, well... I'm not about that. You say, oh, but, but it takes money to run a ministry. Well, of course it does. But my Bible says that every beast of the forest is whose? It's his. And how many cattle? The cattle on how many hills? A thousand hills. Does that mean that God can take care of a ministry? If he owns the cattle on a thousand hills, can he take care of me? Can he take care of you? Of course he can. The silver is mine and the gold is mine. Whose is it? Does it belong to Bill Gates or J.P. Morgan or the Rockefellers or the, the Pope? No. The Bible says it's God's. And so if I'm going to follow him, then he has pledged, I'm going to take care of you. Amen. So then I don't have to divert off this way and say, oh, well, you know, that guy's, I've heard people, ministers say, well, you know, he's got deep pockets. And I, so I can't say that because it could upset him and, and he wouldn't pull anything out of his deep pocket to support me. So I, I better not say that. Excuse me? I had a guy, first started the ministry 20 odd, 20, 30, 30 years ago. He called me and he said, I didn't like your recent DVD. I said, well, why didn't you like it? He said, well, it wasn't according to Uriah Smith. 
I said, I'm not interested in Uriah Smith. I said, was it in harmony with the Bible? He said, it wasn't in harmony with Uriah Smith. And he said, and I have a check for $20,000. I had just made out to you, but I'm not going to send it until you withdraw all those DVDs. And I said, keep your $20,000. I'm not interested in Uriah Smith. I'm not interested in the church fathers. I'm not interested in what this man or this man says. I'm interested in what the Bible says. What a novel idea, isn't it? How novel. Let's take a look. Church and state. Republicanism and Protestantism. Great controversy, page 441. He had two horns like a lamb, Revelation 13, 11. The lamb-like horns indicated youth, innocence, and gentleness, fitly representing the character of the United States when presented to the prophet is coming up in 1798. Among the Christian exiles who first fled to America and sought an asylum from royal oppression and priestly intolerance were many who determined to establish a government upon the broad foundation of civil and religious liberty. You know, how about the Puritans of, of New England? Did they seek to establish a government on the foundation of civil and religious liberty? No, they didn't. Because the Protestants that came from Europe to America, the Puritans and the Pilgrims, what did they do when they got here? They started stuffing their religion down people's throats. They said, we're going to tell you how to worship God, didn't they? Who was the one man, who was the Pilgrim father that stood up and said, no man has the right to legislate the first table of the Ten Commandments. Who said that? What was his name? Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. And what is your name? What is it? Tyree? Tyree? Tony. Okay. I like to call names because you guys know my name, so now you have an advantage over me because I don't know yours. So... Tony and Elma? Edna. Edna. I knew it started with an E and it ended with an A. Okay, Edna and Tony. I'm going to hope by tomorrow afternoon at the Q&A, it is Edna, right? It's Edna. Okay, good. I thought you were chuckling because I'd missed it twice. I hope to know all of your names by tomorrow afternoon during the Q&A. That's my goal. Okay, so Roger Williams, Tony, you were absolutely correct. He said, no government, no church can legislate the first table of the law because the first table tells us about our relationship to God and no man can step in between us and our maker. That's what Roger Williams said. It was Roger Williams' views that found place in the Declaration of Independence which sets forth the great truth that all men are created equal and endowed with the inalienable right to life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. Now, tragically, folk, you know, I mean, Ellen White's describing the rise of the United States. She's not going into what happened in American history but tragically, as, as Martin Luther King Jr. rightly said at his famous I Have a Dream speech, a lot of Americans were given a blank check, he said. Do you remember that statement? He said, we were told that all men were created equal, but that didn't happen in early American history. And it still is not happening, friends. We are still plagued by that today. And it's not, it's, it's about many races. It's about Native Americans. It's about black Americans. It's about Spanish Americans. So tragically, folk, these are awesome words. But tragically, they have not been given as they should have been 
to all of us. It's tragic. But the Constitution guarantees to the people the right of self-government, providing that representatives elected by the popular vote shall enact and administer the laws. Freedom of religious faith was also granted, every man being permitted to worship God according to the dictates of his conscience. Republicanism and Protestantism became the fundamental principles of the nation. So the great principles of republicanism and Protestantism were the cornerstones that made America great. Tragically, as, as we just said, because we gave a blank check to the black people that came from Africa, well, that's why we fought the horrible civil war. That's why it happened, folks. So, Jesus, in Luke chapter 20, verse 25, he set down a principle, an immortal principle, friends, that had not been exi in existence before he came for the first 4,000 years of Earth's history. And that was, he said, render therefore unto Caesar the things which be Caesar's, and unto God the things which be God's. Jesus saw clearly the grand truth that the church and the state, both in their sphere, were to be honored, but they were never to be brought together. Never. Never. And so Christ stated that in a time in the first century when the Roman Empire felt they were God. That's why John the Beloved, when he wrote his, the book of Revelation, where was he? He was on the Isle of what? Patmos. Patmos. That's right. And what is your name, ma'am? Yeah, I'm talking to you, absolutely, ma'am. Joanne. Joanne. Thank you, Joanne. See, the only way I'm going to learn your names is when I hear you speak. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get you. <laughs> Thanks, Joanne. And Edna and Tony. All right. And you. That's right. <laughs> Jesus declared that since they were living under the protection of the Roman power, they should render to that power the support it claimed. So long as this did not conflict with a higher duty. But while peacefully, peaceably subject to the laws of the land, they should at all times give their first allegiance to God. So there Jesus encapsulated the great truth that the church and state should both be honored in their sphere, but should never be together. Now America in Revelation 13 verse 11 it says it had two horns like a lamb. Started at least the principles of government were the principles of Christ. And those principles are these. Freedom to worship God as one chose, the total separation of the church and the state, and the power of the government would rest with the people. Those are the principles of government of Christ. The way that we know that is because the first beast of Revelation 13, 1 to 10, the papal power, they were given their authority by the dragon. And the principles the papacy adopted being led by the dragon through the dark ages, you couldn't choose who you wanted to worship. You had to worship the pope. The church and state were united together. And the power of the government did not rest with the people. It rested with one man. As some people today say that we're a democracy and that we started with a Christian government. Folk, we are not, we have never been, 
and we should never be a democracy. Do you know what a democracy is? A democracy is mob rule. That's what a democracy is. If you have 10 people and, and I have one, the mob decides, that's a democracy. We're not a democracy, folks. We are a republic. We are a republican government. A republic is based on law. It's law. It's not based on the majority. Madison, Jefferson, Washington set up the Constitution to save America from democracy so that everybody would have rights. Everybody could worship God as they chose. Now many people today say that we started as a Christian government. We were not a Christian government, folks. Though Christianity flourished in the minds of the citizens and leaders of America, neutrality in matters of religion had become official government doctrine. This philosophy appeared in the Treaty of Peace and Friendship with Tripoli, uh, November 4, 1796, during the administration of Washington. This document declared that the government of the United States of America is not in any sense founded on the Christian religion. Tragically, folk, when you hear people today, and we've been hearing it now for the last 30 to 40 years, when people say that we were a Christian government, what they're saying is, we're going to force religion down your throat again. That's what they're saying, plain and simple. In founding a nation based on the principles of Christ, it would guarantee that no one would ever be forced to worship God a certain way. Everyone would be left free to choose their own religion. And the First Amendment to the Constitution said Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. Well, this, 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 is, this is a revolution right here. Do you realize that? That is a revolutionary statement. No nation, no nation in the history of humanity for the last 6,000 years had ever given its citizens the freedom to worship as they chose. No one. And as we said, tragically, tragically, for a lot of Americans, they weren't given that right e either, even though the First Amendment said they should be. The concept of separation of church and state refers to the distance and the relationship between organized religion and the nation state. The term is an offshoot of the phrase wall of separation between church and state. It was actually first written by Thomas Jefferson in 1802. Jefferson said, I contemplate with sovereign reverence that act of the whole American people which declared that their legislature should make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof, thus building a wall of separation between the church and the state. Now why, why were the people who pinned the Constitution, why did they pin this? Why did they say people in America should have the right to worship as they chose? Why did they do that? 
Can somebody tell me? How am I going to learn your names if you don't respond? All right, ma'am, right there. What's your name? Jocelyn. Jocelyn. Jocelyn and Joanne. The two J's, okay. You better sit together tomorrow because I'm going to connect you to JJ. Okay. Jocelyn, why? They had seen what happened in the old world. And they said, we will never duplicate that here. That's right. Thank you, Jocelyn. Absolutely. But the Bible tells us that there would come a time when America would no longer have the horns of a lamb, but would speak as a dragon. The Bible says, and I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth. He had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon. So America would one day give up religious freedom. They would one day join the church and the state together. They would make light of the First Amendment. The Bible says, and he exercises, America exercises all the power of the first beast before him. And who was the first beast of Revelation 13, 1 to 10? Who was it? What was your name, sir? Gary. Gary, okay. Let me see, we got Gary, we got Tony, we have Edna, we have Jocelyn, we have Joanne so far. Good. Okay. Tony. Gary. I'm sorry. Gary. I'm not telling you I'm not going to make mistakes. I'm, I'm, okay, you've already seen that. All right, thank you, Gary. The first beast of Revelation 13 is the papacy. He got it right, absolutely. Gary nailed it. Now, folk, you know, there's a lot of folk in Adventism today that they won't tell you that. No, they, won't. they won't discuss it. They won't discuss it. And that's right. I got a book from a lady in Southern California when I was out of Loma Linda several years ago. She said, there's a, there's a book that was put out from Andrews University. It's about two and a half inches thick. It was done by a, he's a professor at Andrews. He's a, I think he's from Eastern Europe. His name is Ranko Stefanovic. And uh, they said, would you look at it and tell me what you think? Well, folk, when you get a book by an Adventist today, there's two places. Oh, absolutely, Tony. You got to be careful. But the two places you can go, especially if it's on prophecy, go to Daniel chapter 8 and then go to Revelation 13. In Daniel chapter 8, most modern Adventists today, they'll, they'll run away from Daniel 8, 14 as fast as their little legs can take them. And then when you come to Revelation 13, Adventists become absolutely tongue-tied over who the first beast is. This guy, Ranko Stefanovic, I mean, come on, folk. Two and a half inch thick book? The guy's just as verbal and intelligent and, and an intellectual as, as they come. But he could not tell who the first beast was. He couldn't do it. So I closed the book up. I left it in my, uh, my library, but I've, I've never opened it again since then. Because to me, it's a piece of garbage. It's a piece of garbage. Um, But the first beast is the papacy. And the Bible is clear at the end, towards the end of Earth's history, the United States will renounce its religious beliefs, keeping the church and state separate, making sure everybody can worship God as they choose, and they will unite with the principles of Rome. 
and will cause the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. Now, folk, that word worship is fascinating because that is the key issue at the end of time. It's worship. Revelation chapter 13 speaks of worship or derivatives, worship, worshipeth, worshiped, five times the word is used in Revelation 13. Here's a quiz question. Tell me the book in the Bible that speaks of worship more than any other in all of scripture. Now think about it. It was false worship, Anybody want to take a shot? It's in the Old Testament. Kings. Is it in the book of Kings? Jocelyn, no, it's not in the book of Kings. That's a good try. Anybody else want to take a crack? Is it Exodus? Edna, that's a good try. It's not Exodus. Isaiah? Not Isaiah. Who said Isaiah? Come on. Tony, come on now. I need, ma'am? I think you said something right there. You didn't? But what's your name? I'm Pat. Pat. All right. Well, thank you, Pat. It's nice to meet you. Okay, I'll, I'll fill in a few more details. It's about three young men. Tony, you said it the second time? All right, where in the book of Daniel? Daniel chapter what? Three young men. The king raises up a, a metal man, a golden statue. And he starts playing all kinds of wild music. And he tells them to bow down when you hear the music. Daniel chapter 3. Daniel chapter 3. Worship folk. Jesus laid it bare, Matthew 15, verses 1 to 9. He said, In vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. So false worship centers around the traditions of men. Okay? And Revelation 14, 7 and 9, of course, in verse 7, it, it says that those worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters, which connects to the Sabbath. In verse 9, the inhabitants of the earth are warned. If any man worship the beast in his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God. So the great issue, friends, at the end of time, it's over the commandments of God versus the traditions of men. That's what the issue is. I had a Catholic priest come to some meetings we had in Oregon a number of years ago. He and his secretary came to the meeting and there were a bunch of Seventh-day Adventists sitting around them. The reason they came, the reason they knew we were there is because we had mass mailed the secret terrorist book, Edna, to three towns right there in southern Oregon, right near the Pacific Ocean, Coos Bay, Myrtle Point, Bandon. Well, there were so many people in the press, the newspaper, and they said, Hughes is a nut. He is an absolute crazy man. They said, he is worse than Adolf Hitler. <laughs> oh, folk. So the priest shows up at the meeting and there's a bunch of Adventists sitting around the priest and his secretary. And when we got to worship in Revelation 13 and 14, the commandments of God versus the traditions of men, the Sabbath versus Sunday, the secretary turns to the priest and says, Hughes doesn't have a clue, does he? You know what the priest said? The priest said, don't be so sure about that. 
He knew Jocelyn. He knew. The prediction that America would speak as a dragon and exercise all the power of the papacy plainly foretells the development of the spirit of intolerance and persecution that was manifest by the nations represented by the dragon and the leopard-like beast. The statement that the beast with two horns would cause the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast indicates that the authority of this nation is to be exercised in enforcing some observance which shall be an act of homage to the papacy. See, a lot of folk poo-poo Ellen White and they say, oh, well, she doesn't know what she's talking about. Folks, she just, she just described exactly what Revelation 13 is talking about. She did know what she was talking about. It's these Adventist scholars that are so intelligent. You know, they're so intelligent, they're fools. That's what they are. Just fools. Such action would be directly contrary to the principles of this government, to the genius of its free institutions, to the direct and solemn avowals of the Declaration of Independence, and to the Constitution. The founders of the nation wisely sought to guard against the employment of secular power on the part of the state with, with its inevitable result in tolerance and persecution. There you have it. There you have it. Well, now we come down to today. We're going to take a look at a few men now. This guy right here. Does anybody know his name? He was a Supreme Court Justice back in the 80s and 90s. Supreme Court Justice of the United States. Pat, do you know? You've heard of him, okay. Gary, do you, uh, Gary, do you know? William Rehnquist, that's right. I'm just going around asking folk whose names I already know just so I can practice. Jocelyn, you, you picked that up, didn't you? Joyce, you're next. It is Joyce, right? Joanne. Joanne. I knew it started with a J. Joanne. William Rehnquist, right here. Supreme Court Justice, in cahoots with his master, right here. This is what William Rehnquist said. As the Chief Justice of the United States 30 years ago, the greatest injury of the wall notion, the wall of separation of church and state, that's what he's talking about, is its mischievous diversion of judges from the actual intentions of the drafters of the Bill of Rights. What's Rehnquist saying? He's saying that the idea that the church and state should be separate is a mischievous diversion. He goes on, the wall of separation between church and state is a metaphor based on bad history. A metaphor which has proved useless as a guide to judging. It should be frankly and explicitly abandoned. Now that man's speaking like a dragon, isn't he? He's speaking like a devil. That was back 30, 35 years ago. This man, Antonin Scalia, devout Roman Catholic, Rehnquist was too. There was a case back in 1990, again, 35 years ago, there were two gentlemen, uh, they were both uh, of Indian background, they had a religious rite where they would use a drug called peyote. The use of the drug did not affect their work skills in the least. They both were government employees. The men were fired from their jobs for using peyote in a religious service. Well, these men took this case all the way to the Supreme Court. And Antonin Scalia, let's see if I've got it here. Here it is. Antonin Scalia went far beyond the case and declared that when religious rights clash with the government's need for uniform rules, the court will side with the government. 
You see what he's saying, that, what it's saying there? If somebody's rights are being broken, are being taken away, if the government needs uniformity, then the court will side with the government and poo-poo any religious right that you have. Scalia went on, he said, we cannot afford the luxury of striking down laws simply because they limit someone's religious practice. That was 1990, folks. That was 35 years ago. America has been speaking as a dragon. Speaking as a dragon. Yeah, that's right, Tony. All those Catholics. Seven out of nine of them, Roman Catholic. The other two are members of the Council on Foreign Relations, which is a Jesuit front institution. So all nine of the Supreme Court justices have vowed obedience to the Pope of Rome. All nine of them, folk. Now this is an old picture we could add in there Neil Gorsuch. You know, a lot of folks sit back and, well, Dr. Ben Carson. How many of you have heard of Dr. Ben Carson? Okay. Gifted Hands, one of the greatest books. I read it to my students when I, the last teaching job I had in California. And when he gets up, you know, when he tells a story when he's in fifth grade and the teacher says, um, Okay, now I'm gonna go around the room and you're gonna tell me how many you got right on the test. And so they go around, you know, and the teacher says, uh, Charlie, I got six. And, and Bobby, I got five. And, and Freddie, I got 10. And then the teacher comes to Ben. Now Ben was not a serious student at that time. And so the teacher says, Ben, how did, what did you get? And Ben Carson says, none. And the teacher says, oh, great, Ben, you got nine. <laughs> and all the children in the room say, they start laughing. They say, he didn't say nine, he said none. <laughs> but you know, Ben Carson's mom she got a hold of him and, and his brother and, they, and she said, look, you boys are, you guys can do it. And you're gonna read books and you're gonna, you're gonna your abilities are gonna improve and, and you're gonna fulfill your destiny. And of course, Ben Carson became the, one of the greatest neurosurgeons in the world at John Hopkins University. What a story, gifted hands. But folk, I saw an interview that Ben Carson did recently with um, Tucker Carlson where he, he stated that Donald Trump is God's man for this time. What? What? Sounds like Ben Carson's been using peyote. Yeah. <laughs> folk, come on. Do you realize that during Donald Trump's presidency, he put three Roman Catholics on the Supreme Court? Gorsuch, Kavanaugh, and Barrett? Come on. Come on, Ben. Here's another guy, David Barton, just saying that the United States was founded on Christian, you know, as a Christian nation, and we got to get back to God. Shame on him. Shame on him. And now today, the Speaker of the House, Mike Johnson, a Republican from Louisiana, who is a part of the Project 2025, who is a Heritage Foundation activist, he said the ch separation of church and state is a misnomer. No, it's not a misnomer. The separation of church and state is the greatest protection ever put into place for a nation in the history of this planet. 
It's not a misnomer. People misunderstand it, he continued. What, what's his point here? Folk, he's trying to break it down so that the church and state can come together. And he's the speaker of the house. He's the third most powerful man in this country. Of course it comes from a phrase that was written in a letter that Jefferson wrote. It's not in the Constitution. Not, not written verbatim, but it's there, friends. It's there. And what he was explaining is that they did not want the government to encroach upon the church, not that they didn't want principles of faith to have influence on our public life. Ellen White Ward, Great Controversy 605 and 606. She said, heretofore, those who presented the truths of the third angel's message have often been regarded as mere alarmists. Their predictions that religious intolerance would gain control in the United States, that church and state would unite to persecute those who keep the commandments of God, have been pronounced groundless and absurd. It has been confidently declared that this land could never become other than what it has been, the defender of religious freedom. But as the question of enforcing Sunday observance is widely agitated, the event so long doubted and disbelieved is seen to be approaching. And the third message will produce an effect which it could not have had before. Oh, friends, isn't that incredible? We're, we're watching these men who are speaking like dragons. First Rehnquist, then Scalia, then Barton, and now... Uh, Johnson from Louisiana, the Speaker of the House, they're speaking as dragons. And they're saying, we want to obliterate that wall so that we can then determine what Americans believe. And friends, God will allow that. He will allow that. So that all those people who have said, oh, those Adventists, they're alarmists. They're, they don't know what they're talking about. Oh, but they do. Because what they're saying is based on the Bible. It's based on the Bible. With the additional light from the great controversy. And friends, can you, can you just think? Think about when Ellen White says the third message will produce an effect which it could not have had before. Friends, when Sunday begins to be agitated, it, it is going to shake this planet, friends. It will shake this planet. And those Adventists that have been poo-pooing Ellen White for decades and, and, and turning away from the truth, Friends, they'll embrace Sunday. But as, as Pastor Turner said tonight, those ranks that have been depleted will be filled with people who will come in and embrace the truth as it is in Jesus. Friends, let, let's just stand. Let's stand. We live in an awesome time an awesome time, and you and I, you and I have been called, we've been called, friends, for such a time as this. Stand, friends, stand. I'm excited, I'm excited. The best, the best is coming. It's coming, friends, and it's gonna be awesome. It's gonna be awesome. Well, I don't know how to mess with this, and I'll probably break it. So let's just kneel for prayer for those who can, and I'll just talk as loud as I can without the speaker, okay? Dear Father in heaven, thank you so much that we have a sure word of prophecy it shines, it still shines as a light in a dark place. And Lord, 
This world is getting darker and darker by the day. Deception is so thick you can cut it with a knife. But thank you for the sure word of prophecy. Thank you that it lights the future. It lights the present. It shows us where we are. Father, empower each one of us. You've called each one of us for such a time as this. Bless, strengthen each one of us here this evening and all that will watch this video. Bless us to hold on to the wonderful and mighty hand of Christ that will be faithful and true. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, I'm going to try it again. Now, don't anybody get up yet. Okay, Joanne. I got it, right? Jocelyn, why are you looking at me like that? Jocelyn, okay. <laughs> so Joanne and Jocelyn, and Edna and Tony, and Gary. Oh no, no, no. I yeah, I'm just waiting for her to look at me. She she won't she won't she won't look at me straight. She she's gotta turn her head. Come on, Pat. <laughs> Folk have a safe trip home. I look forward to see you all in the morning. Happy Sabbath.